Right now, there is classical music playing. Why am I not hearing it? Because I'm not tuned in to the station that is playing it. If I tuned into it, I would hear it. Right now, whatever you want, BNS, it exists right now. Why do you not have it? Because you're not tuned into it. Hey guys, today our guest is Hina Khan. Hina Khan is a peak performance mindset coach and former psychotherapist. Hina has been a student of the mind, human behavior, and human potential for over a decade. She uses her training from the Distinguished Center for Training in Psychotherapy and the mentorship she has received with Bob Proctor to help many to achieve their goals and also helps people to make their annual income their monthly income. Hina also makes regular appearances on the television as a resident expert and has been the go-to expert for a variety of national networks such as CBC, CTV, W Network and more. She is also the host of Possibilities with Hina Khan podcast where she speaks directly to listeners offering coaching and advice helping us to unlock our infinite possibilities and to create a life we love with ease joy and fun i'm very very happy to welcome hina khan to the show thanks hina for coming to the show thank you i'm so happy to be here awesome thank you we are so happy to receive you as well hina before we go to the questions where can people connect with you they can connect with me on my website, hinnacon.ca. They can connect with me on Instagram at Coach with Hina, TikTok at Coach with Hina. Those are probably the three best places to start. Awesome. Thank you, Hina. Hina, my first question is, what is the role of self-image in one's mm. personal and professional growth? <sighs> BNS, self-image is everything. I remember my mentor, Bob, telling me, you cannot outperform your self-image. The self-image is the benchmark for your accomplishments. And when we're talking about self-image, I'm not talking about what you see when you look in the mirror. I'm talking about the part of you that is with you when you're dressed up, when you're giving a talk, when you are going to bed, when you are lounging around on the weekends, it's that part of you that is with you at all times. It's that part of you that holds how you truly feel about yourself. And that will then determine what is possible for you, what you will allow yourself to receive and what you will block in your life. Self-image is everything. Whenever I have a goal that I want to accomplish, I always ask myself, who do I need to be? What would be the self image of the person? Does my inner talk match the inner talk of the person with the goal? <laughs> yes, uh, exactly, Hina. And uh, when I was researching about you, like uh, self image came so many times that I know that self image largely determines many things. Thank you. Yes. Hina how to make our annual income or monthly income you know that also comes down to self-image first of all it's a decision that you make not everybody has that desire and there's some people that when you say that they can they cannot even imagine it they're like I, I don't understand and that's because they have a belief that money comes from things. It comes from their employer. It comes from their clients. It comes from the work that they do. But that's not true. That's a misunderstanding about money. Money is energy. Money comes through those things. And money can come through infinite ways to you if you decide that. So the first thing you want to do is make the decision if that's something that you desire. If it's something that you desire, the next question that people get stumped on is how, how am I going to do that? And they immediately go to the beliefs that they hold, which could be limiting, like that means I'll have to work more hours. That means that I will sacrifice my family, my friends, my personal time. And that's not the case at all. I am not about the hustle, the grind or the struggle, because I believe we can create through ease, joy and fun. And so because of those beliefs that it will be hard or the how eludes them 
many people will give up at that point. That is not the question you want to ask. If you make the decision that you want to make your annual income, your monthly income, then you must ask yourself, who do I need to become? Because all of our results come from awareness. The reason that your annual income is not your monthly income is because you're not aware of the how but it is all here. Creation is finished. The possibility of it is here. So the work is not to work harder. The work is not about starting a bunch of different things. The work is first on the inside, your self image, lining up your thoughts and beliefs, and then moving into the actions from that place. And then it's relatively easy. So many of my clients have done it. I have done it multiple times. Um, you know, at different levels as well. But it all starts with who do you need to be? As Hina. And Hina, I just want to go into a little deep about this topic. Like you always say that we can create a life that we love without the grind, uh, struggle and hustle. So can you talk more about that? Like, is it possible to create a life without hustle? Yes, I'm living proof of it. My motto is the more I rest, the more I make. So this idea of hustle, grind and struggle, especially in the entrepreneurial world, I think is really from a masculine energy. So we all have masculine and feminine energy and it's from this masculine energy of doing. And it's so important. We want to do, but it does not have to be hard. It does not have to add hours to your day. And as a woman, I think, you know, for many of us that have families and men too now, we want to create in a different way because I don't want to sacrifice my family time. I don't want to feel like either I have professional success and my family life suffers or I have a rich family life, but I will not be able to have the professional success that I desire. I want to have it all. I desire to have it all. I believe I can have it all. I was born to have it all. So what I decided was that there's got to be a way to be able to create through ease. And really that's leaning into feminine energy, which you have, which I have. So the feminine, it's like the conscious mind is the masculine. The feminine is the subconscious and the feminine is the womb of creation. So the way that we do that is we connect to our higher faculties. So when we are in the hustle, grind and struggle, we are very much in our five senses, what we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. And we're in that space. When we are creating through ease, joy and fun, we are using our higher faculties of imagination, intuition, perception, memory, will and reason. That is how you create with ease, joy and fun because you're allowing yourself to get ideas, move on those ideas, but with a lightness. So if we look at even the science and the research behind this, only 16% of breakthroughs happen at your desk. When do you have your great ideas? When you're in the shower. Why? Because, you, because your subconscious is open. You're open to ideas coming to you. When do you have great ideas? When you're out for a walk when you are engaged in a different activity. But sometimes we dismiss it because we don't feel like it's valid because it came too easy. So we make it hard. We're like, well, that came too easy and that could be a really good idea, but it came too easy. So let me complicate it. Let me think, let me think about how I can make it hard because if the idea is easy, and I get incredible results, will I have earned it? I didn't work hard enough for it. I'm not burnt out, I'm not exhausted. So then I haven't earned it. So there's a lot of layers to this. So when I say the more I rest, the more I make, it's because I'm putting myself in a state of receiving and allowing, receiving and allowing beautiful ideas to come to me and then moving on it. And what I realized, it doesn't have to be hard maybe it shouldn't be hard. And so I've created a belief for myself that things only get better and better and better and it gets easier and easier and easier and I am so supported and I can't get it wrong and everything is always working out for me. 
and I do, I do, I'm in doing because I love doing. We want to do, do, doing is what allows us to have that, that experience of it. I'm all about that, but it's not hard because I'm in flow. Yes, so you can absolutely Absolutely, Hina. Hina, then how to have our subconscious mind to be in alignment and harmony with our goals? So first of all, you've got to know what do you want? What do you want, PNS? Not what do your parents want? Not what do your friends want? Not, to, not what other people think you should have or not have. What do you want? What do you want? And you've got to get really honest with yourself and clear about that. Because your current environment, the results that you have right now are actually a reflection of your past. Your present is your, uh, your past. It's kind of like it was past things that you were seeding that have come up. So if you want something different, you're going to have to do something different, but understand your current environment, including your internal environment is set up for your current results. So once you decide what it is that you want, then what you want to do is say, okay, from this place of what I want, what would my thoughts be? And I can guarantee you there's some things that you are thinking right now that got you to where you are right now that would not be part of your thinking from the place of the goal. And then you would go to, and how would I feel? So now, and the feeling is the subconscious. This is the subconscious. It's what you're emotionalizing it. You see, your conscious mind can accept or reject an idea. But once it's once you turn it over to your subconscious mind, now it accepts it and it creates emotion and feelings around it. So how would you feel? What would that be like? And now from that place, you're going to take action. And the action is in alignment. So what we want it to be is like, think of a traffic light. We want it to be green conscious, green subject, uh, subconscious, green in your body, all in alignment. You're not having contradictory thoughts. You're not having, I really, really want this, but I'm too old, I'm too young, I can't do it now, I don't have the education, I live in this part of the world, I live in that part of the world. It's like, I want it now, it is available for me, this would be so beautiful, I'm confident I have this. So then we're moving it into the present state. And now think of it. Think of it like you're, you're planting it into the fertile soil of your mind, your marvelous mind. What you plant in there is going to grow, just like if I'm going to plant carrots, I'm going to get carrots. I'm not shocked when I get carrots and going, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to get apples. So whatever we're planting is going to grow. So in the present, you are creating your future by what you're planting. Or in the present, you're creating your past by being on autopilot and just doing the same thing over and over again. So that is how we use our subconscious mind, the womb of creation, to create a life that we love. But the work is, there's because here's the thing. So, so you say that, you're like, yes, I want this. I want it. Oh, yes, I feel I am the person. I can feel it. You can visualize it in your mind. You are there. You're living that life. Then you open your eyes and you are in the same dang house. You're in this, your bank account is the same. You know, you're looking around, you know, it's all the same people around you. So now what you need to do is respond to your current circumstances from this place, from this new place as your present. Is this making sense, BNS? Yes. Are you, are you, you're with me? You're tracking with me. All right. So what you need to do. So now it's, it's, and, and so your bank account is the same, but you're responding from prosperity. If that's something you desire, you're responding from your seven figure, eight figure self, whatever it is that you desire to that current condition. And then you're going to start to see the condition change. But most people are, 
are go they, they see whatever their bank account is they see you know because we've been programmed this way since we were young with the report cards we make that define us and then we're like oh i'm not good at math or i am not this or i am not that and so you want to start to respond differently so that you are not having yourself being controlled by the external circumstances. You are remaining in control no matter the external circumstances. And that to me is like the road to self-mastery. That's really amazing, Hina. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Hina, can you explain what is 50 want list exercise? Yeah, so this is a way to get into what it is that you truly desire. And it's also a way to see what judgments come up for you as well. I'll ask my clients to make a 50 want list, but here's the thing. It's 50 things that you want that money can buy. Because I know some people are like, money's not important, or I don't need this, or I don't need that. So just play and just do it because it'll, it'll open you up. And then you look at this list and honestly, BNS, for some of my clients, it's taken them weeks to do. Oh. For others, it's been faster. But you look at the list and then you're like, what could I start to do now as a version of it? Maybe I can't, you know, buy that thing that I desire, but I can buy, you know, an, an, an older model of it. Maybe I can't get massages once a, you know, once a month, but I can get one once every three months. Maybe I can, so you can start to see like, what could I do that's a version of it now? You'll also see what judgments you have. Like, oh, I shouldn't want that. That feels greedy. You know what? I don't really need that. So it's a way to bring up any judgments that you have and also to lean in to what you really want because most of us don't know what we want. We were told what we should want because of societal expectations or we're looking outside and we're looking at people online and thinking, I guess I should want that. That's what success looks like. So this allows you to go into your own, to go within and see what would I love? What would I want? And giving yourself permission to do that. I mean, think about it. For those of you that celebrate Christmas, that's what your want list is. You know, you didn't, you know, when you're making your list for Santa, you're just like thinking of all the things that you want and there's a freedom around it. So it's it's tapping back into that. Awesome, Hina, really awesome. Hina, how to be in the top 1% of the industry and how to do it consistently? Yes, that's the thing, isn't it, BNS? You know, many people can get to a top place in their industry, but the sustaining of it, where when you sustain it, you've made it a habit. I will never not be in the top 1%. It's not possible for me not to be. Like I, I literally cannot be. There's not a version of me that exists that is not in the top 1%. It wasn't always that way. So the first thing you want to do is, again, if that's something that you desire, admit that you want it, that you want to be the top in your industry. And then what you want to do is you could even look at those in the top of your industry. And many people will look and say, oh, I wonder, I wonder what they're doing. Like, how are they doing it? And like I said, the how doesn't matter. What you want to ask them or find out is what do you think? When you're, let's say, it, let's say it's an industry where you have to do sales calls. When you're doing sales calls, what is the energy that you're coming from? Are you coming from service? Are you coming from a place of, I need to get this sale? Are you coming from a place of really listening to them? Or are you coming from a place of, listening to what's in it for you. These questions are really important because then you'll understand who the person is. All of the strategies work, whether you decide that you're cold calling or doing it in a different way, it all works. It depends on how you're thinking about it. 
and the energy behind it and your belief and your expectation. Do you expect people to sign up with you? Or do you expect to have a lot of no's? So these are the things that you want to start to integrate and you want to create a self image of you, the version of you as the top 1%. And as you create this version of you, you want to be that person. Now, you're not going to be that person only when you're on a sales call. How does the top 1% start their day? What are things that they're available for? What are things that they're not available for? How do they, I even looked at things like, how do I buy? How do I feel when somebody is sharing with me their product or service? These are all things that will help you be in the top 1%. And then you move into the doing. You absolutely move into action, but you're moving into action from the place of the top 1%. You're not waiting for the action to get you to the 1%. You have to accept that you are the top 1%. And now you have embodied that and now your actions are a part of that. So the outside world will match that inner conviction that you have. And nobody tells you that you're the top 1%. Nobody's going to tell, I am the top 1%. I am her. And so I don't need, a, I don't need a certificate. I don't need a recognition. I don't need anybody to tell me that because I am her. And then I'll just wait for, you guys can catch up when you do, but that is who I am. And then the outer world does catch up. And I and I have been in the top 1% in my industry for 20 times in a row, back to back to back, which is over years sustaining it. And that's why I said to you, BNS, I will never not be. No matter what industry I'm in, I will always be at the top. It's just who I am. It's what I desire. That's the version of me. But before it was on the outside, it was on the inside. And I held that belief, even when everything around me was like, oh, Lordy, you are not the top 1%. But inside, I was the top 1%. I am the top 1%. But I, I am that in every area of my life. So even how I get up in the morning, the things that I do, how I am with my family, how I am with my clients because the top 1% for me is about service. So I always wanna leave everybody I meet with the experience of increase. That is who I am. And that is one of the qualities of the top 1%. I've also, honestly, I've been so blessed to have the best mentors, you know, Bob Proctor and Steve Hardison. And when I work with a mentor, I like to work with them. I like to go deep with one person it might be my psychotherapy background as opposed to like a lot of different mentors. And, you know, I see Steve and I see Bob. I worked very closely with Bob. Bob didn't live far from me. And I would see him how he was. I mean, this is a man in the top 1% God of his industry, a pioneer worked right up until his last breath was of service. And I would see how he was of service all the time. He just wanted to know, how can I help you? And I see that with Steve too. I remember I was at Steve's office in, in, uh, in Arizona and, you know, after your session, he'll put the windows up so you can see when your Uber comes. So we did that and he left. So he left the room so I could wait there for my, my drive. And I could see him I guess it was the day of recycling and garbage and he's he's move he's putting pulling his bins up the driveway and then I see him go to the next door neighbor and pull the next door neighbor's bins up. And that was like Bob too. I would see how Bob was with the person that was tidying up the seminar room at the hotel. He, would, he wanted to know what their goals were. He would be asking them, you know, to the, to the people that have paid him, you know, six figures and more to spend time with him. There was no difference. And for me, that's what being at the top is. So I started to embody that 
well before, and then it showed up in my outer world as well. Thank you, Hina. Hina, you already talked about it, but if I ask you what is the number one lesson that you learned from Bob Proctor, what would be it? The per- there's so many. There's so many, BNS. You cannot make me choose one. You can't. I refuse. <laughs> I'm going to have to give you a few. Sure. Cut it out. <laughs> Cut it out, but I can't. Bless his heart. Such a great man. Such a great man. So one thing that changed my life was when he taught me that selling is not something you do to somebody. It is something you do for somebody. And that selling is being of service. So, cause I had some, you know, some limiting beliefs around selling. So there was that, but also that the person that's in front of you is the most important person. Um, so there was that also, you know, what he taught me BNS was how to make decisions. We're not taught how to make decisions. We're always pulling out polls. What do you think I should do? Should I do this? Should I do that? And he really taught me, and this is again about the top 1%, a character trait, that successful people make decisions quickly. And they they are decisive. They're not taking polls, asking everybody what they should do all the time. And so he really taught me that as well. So, so many things I learned from him. God bless him. Yeah. Thank you, Hina. I think now this is a perfect question to ask you. Why is the habit of decision making is so important and how to make good decisions? So people think that I can't, people think that it's the decision that is so painful. Like I've got to make this decision. I don't know what to do. It's the indecision that is painful it's it's make a freaking decision and then you can move in that direction right it's that indecision going back and forth asking everybody and here's the thing this is what bob would say and then you're asking people that don't have what it is that you desire and we're giving them a vote in our life right like you know there's some like you know we're asking people that have never taken a risk should we take this risk Well, what are they going to say? They're going to be like, no. And it's not because they don't want you to do well. It's because they're going to give you their thoughts from their level of awareness. So when you can start to make decisions, I think decision helps you with self-confidence. Because once you can start to do that, you build the trust in yourself. And it's not that every decision you make. So here's the thing that really helped me. I can't get it wrong. I cannot, I literally cannot get it wrong. So there is no bad decision. Every decision will lead me to something, whether it's I learned something, you know, or not. So I cannot get it wrong. And the other thing that really helps me in making decisions quickly is everything is always working out for me. Everything is always working out for me. Everything is for my growth. So that can also help me make decisions quickly. But what I know is this. Nothing happens until you make a decision. If we look at the moon, even, you know, John F. Kennedy asked Werner von Braun, what will it take to send a person to the moon? Werner von Braun said the will to do it. He did not say, well, we need this technology. I mean, I don't know. You're too young, BNS. You are too young. But let me tell you, when I was coming up, phones were attached to the wall. I know that would be shocking for you. You had to stand there by the wall and it had the loopy cord thing and it would always get tangled and wrapped up that is the technology that we had when we sent someone to the moon so the decision once the decision was made then the technology came then the people came then the resources but nothing happens until you make a decision so your life can go by very quickly if you are not making decisions and then what happens is then we feel like oh it's too late now or we've missed the boat so the other thing is to realize when you're making a decision that all you have is now so make the decision the best you can with what you are aware of at that time but once you start to do that and here's the thing look start with the things that are easy even if you're going to a restaurant be decisive about what you want to eat. You know, you can start there. You don't have to start with like, should I move to another country? 
but start with things that you can start to get your energy behind that don't feel so big. as you know like you said when we go to grocery uh, store like a supermarket you can choose either it's a red apple or green apple i still remember that. <laughs> yeah. yes yes just make the decision you can't get it wrong the apple's going to be good <laughs> yes hina thank you thank you so much hina what is the experience of being listened to by steve hardison what have you learned oh. about listening Steve I learned so much from Steve and when it comes to listening you know as he always says what I've learned is that the listener is the most important person in a room because they are defining their experience what I've also learned is that you can learn from anybody you know i was asked the other day like who are your mentors and of course i mentioned bob and steve but i also said the uber driver you know there's it, and that has to do with the quality of your listening not only listening went with somebody being in a powerful session with your coach like Steve but listening to yourself as well you know i it's i find it's hard to describe at times the relationship between a coach and a client you know i'm both i'm coach and client and i love my clients so deeply and i have felt myself i felt myself loved so deeply by my coaches including steve so what does it feel like to be listened to by steve hardison it feels like love in the purest way it feels like love it feels like unconditional love there's nothing that you could say to steve where that would have him waver from loving you nothing nothing absolutely nothing there's nothing i could bring to him in a session that would have him move off the frequency of loving me and that's what it feels like to be so loved when steve is listening to me he's also i don't know if you know this well this is my experience of him he's also really funny i don't know if you have that experience i don't know if others do i can only speak of my experience with him which is also my experience of me i also think i'm very funny <laughs> <laughs> and I tell that to Steve. I'm like and, and he gets and every year I visit him he gets better and better looking. Like he really like he just looks so good and I feel like he just looks better and better every year and then I tell him I guess that means I look better and better every year. So that's a side note. He's funny and good looking. Well, Hina, then I need to ask you this question. Uh-oh. why we are all mirrors to one another yeah i think it's such a beautiful way that we have been created so that we can have an experience of ourselves and learn so much about ourselves through being with others so even in the sense of when you're seeing something and you're judging it you're judging yourself right and so that's a mirror it's you know and when you see somebody and you're like you are hilarious and you're just so beautiful you're also seeing that in yourself you're recognizing it in yourself so it's such a beautiful way for growth and it's an opportunity but many times we'll dismiss it 
but there's such an opportunity because um you know it was i think it was james allen who said i think in secret it comes to pass environment is but my looking glass i think in secret i think in my mind i have these thoughts it comes to pass and then the environment is my mirror the environment is my looking glass the environment is telling me what i think and the environment is always an opportunity to fine tune who you are being. And it's an, it's an opportunity to, to like, you know, to move from concept, this idea in your mind to the experience as well. Thank you, Hina. Hina, uh, what do you mean when you say wealth is a consciousness and money is a habit? Yes. Wealth is a consciousness. There's many people, do you know, BNS, that you would look at their bank account or their investments and you would say, oh my gosh, you are rich, but they have a poverty consciousness. They feel like it's going to run out. They don't want to spend anything. They are scared around money, even though if you looked at their account, you would think, why would you be scared around it? So a wealthy consciousness to me is a prosperous consciousness. It's abundance. It's seeing abundance everywhere. It's, it's wealth in all areas of your life. It's rich relationships, a rich relationship with yourself. It's the richness that you feel in the, in your environment. It's the richness in nature, like looking at the grass, the trees, the sky, the clouds, everything around us. That is a consciousness. And when I talk about money being a habit, it's like how we are with our money. Do you know? Oh, BNS, I, I, there's somebody that I work with and I got to tell you, she often will feel like she doesn't have enough money. Do you know how many invoices she has outstanding of her to send off? So even think of your habits, of your habits of invoicing, your habits around you know, even receiving money, where you're putting the blocks in doing that. Do you look at your money and you want to do this really neutrally, but create some habits around it. One of the things that I've, I learned from Bob as well was to take a hundred percent responsibility for my results. And that was part of me creating powerful money habits of looking at my finances, not judging myself for it, but looking at them and meeting all of my obligations. But the, what is in my bank account does not determine if I'm rich. Because I have a rich consciousness. And then it goes into, then my wealth consciousness goes into like, you know, I provide incredible value and service. My clients love to pay me. My clients pay in full and upfront. Everybody transforms in my energy. You know, my clients are big fans of mine and they are always referring ideal clients to me. So that also becomes part of the wealth consciousness. It's also about your enlarging your capacity to receive. So when I think about making my annual income, your, my monthly income, I think also about enlarging my capacity to receive that because some people have a very hard time receiving so that is why we see bns with lottery winners they go back to their financial set point it doesn't take long for them to spend it all because they they don't know how to receive it and they can't have it so there's some people where they can they can attract they can make the money but it's like a door that it, it comes in the front door and goes right out the back door they don't have a consciousness of having it they're not comfortable with having. So that has to be with the consciousness. Thank you, Hina. Hina, how to live in a world of quantum leaps? Yeah, I love, I love this. Um, we have been taught to take like, just take one step at a time. But my gosh, even like, look at this technology, BNS. You're, where are you in India? Hyderabad. Hyderabad. 
and I'm in Toronto. If you looked at your clock, it's a certain time. If you look at my clock here, it's a certain time. But right now we're just in now. It's now. It's not your time. It's not my time. It's now. And here we are. The technology, I think, is just proof of the ability, the quantum leap. So we don't, I think we've been taught to do like one step at a time, but we can jump a couple rungs in the ladder. And we do that first through our higher faculty of imagination. So Neville Goddard talks about this, and I love this. He talks about it in, I feel like it's chapter 14, I could be wrong, in Power of Awareness, when he says, and the chapter is called The Effortless Way. And he says, the first place that you make that quantum leap is psychologically. It's, a, it's psychological. So first in your mind, you're going from where you are now to where you would like to be. And then you're bringing that future state into the present by emotionalizing it. And then just like the moon, just like getting the rocket ship to the moon, you will start to draw to you exactly what you need. But you can do, you don't have to do like, well, the next logical step. Logical, can that can just keep you limited. You ask yourself, what do you want? And then you jump there first psychologically. This is the effortless way. Then when you get there, BNS, you're going to look back. And the way that he talks about this is the bridge of incidents. That's when you're going to look at, oh, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But it's kind of like, you know, if you're listening, it's so, okay, more. Creation is finished. Creation is finished. So it's also accepting that what you desire, that quantum leap that you desire, it is here. The manifesting is you becoming, is you, is the invisible becoming visible. It's not really creating it. It's you becoming the person to become aware of it. Oh, come on. That was so good. Sometimes I have to take a moment myself, BNS. Do you understand that? Do your listeners understand this? I get passionate about this. So it's not that you're creating it because creation is finished. You are becoming aware of it, aware of its existence. So that's why you can have a quantum leap. That is, so the, our work is to expand our awareness because our results come from our awareness. So for example, right now there is classical music playing. Why am I not hearing it? Because I'm not tuned in to the station that is playing it. If I tuned into it, I would hear it. Right now, whatever you want, BNS, it exists right now. Why do you not have it? Because you're not tuned into it. So what is your work? To become tuned into it. And you do that first psychologically. And then you're hearing it. And it's like, it wasn't like all of a sudden they got a conductor and all of that. It was always here. So the horse and buggy. When we were living in the world of the horse at a time of the horse and buggy, that we had a horse and buggy consciousness. It wasn't that the car wasn't here. It wasn't that there were not other modes of transportation. It was that we did not have the consciousness of it. We were not aware of it. We didn't decide that we wanted it. When it was decided that that's what somebody wanted, that is when everything came to be able to create it. So what you want to do is first make the leap psychologically and then you hold it using your will not will power that's fleeting will your ability to concentrate you emotionalize it you are there now you're bringing that future into the present and that is really the work and to not have contradictory thoughts that take you off of the station if you think of it that way did that help BNS? I don't know. I get passionate <laughs> about these things. Tina, I have to acknowledge this. This was really, really good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do you know what I do in my sessions with Steve? Everyone's sessions with Steve. Oh, yeah. And then I have to tell you something that Steve yes. told me that also changed my life, changed my clients' lives. 
But um, sometimes I'll do exactly that BNS. I will bring a piece of um, literature that I'm studying. And I learned how to study from Bob. Bob taught me how to study. Because sometimes, yeah, anyways, that's another story. But I'll bring it into my session with Steve. And I'll say, Steve, I was thinking about this. And then I will read it to him. And he listens so lovingly, bless his heart. I feel like we just go and we just play. And then we'll just talk about it. And then we apply it. And it's just so much fun. So many times I've brought in Neville Goddard's work to my sessions with Steve. And I'll bring a paragraph to him. Um, and we'll just unpack what it means to me, what it means to him. And it's just magical and beautiful. So let me tell you about something Steve taught me. Yes. <laughs> changed in my life okay bmw i'm not talking about the car yeah this is friggin' life-changing if everybody listening to this only did this one thing your whole life is going to change bmw stands for being my word and again steve is such an example of this I love it when you ask Steve to do something and he'll say, you can count on me not doing that. Because <laughs> he really, because he's not going to do it. And he's not going to put you off and say, well, let me get back to you. Maybe I will. He knows he's not going to do it. He's going to let you know he's not going to do it because he yes. is his word. And if we don't have our word, we don't have anything. And my God, I learned this so deeply with Steve. So, um, Steve had given me um, a watch that he had that had a B on it as a reminder of B my word because it, it just impacted me so much. And I mean, that's just who Steve is. So even on my wrist now, and I've given this to uh, my, some of my clients as well, I have an inner circle. They all have, I don't know if you can see it, this, um, do you see the Bs on yes. it? And it's, it's also a reminder to be my word because we live in a world, honestly, where it is not the norm to be your word, where we will drag people along. We will not be direct with people. We will avoid we and that's what keeps us out of alignment too like we just have that energy on our mind and i remember like steve saying you know he goes i'm very simple and this is how he has simplicity in his life because he doesn't have to remember what did i say to that person did i say i was going to do that and i'm not going to do that because he's always his word so you know if he says he's going to do something, you know he's going to do it. If he says he's not going to do something, you know he won't do it. Like you're not wondering, maybe he'll change his mind. Maybe he will do it. Maybe he didn't really mean it. Like when he says, you can count on me not doing that. He truly means that. And I really appreciate that about him and Bob is that that's, that's who they were. But that was another great lesson. And that, again, these are the traits of the top 1%. You know, if you look at people, and I think this is a trait of a great leader, too, because, again, their people that are working with them don't have to wonder, like, is that true? Did they really mean that? Did they not? It really does keep things simple yes. and easy. 100% Hina. Yes. And that's one of the biggest lessons I have learned from Steve. Uh, that, uh, yeah, like if we give something, we have to stand on it. I'm a man of my of word. So I learned that from Steve. Well, I know you did because you also know that whatever commitments Steve made to you, they're 100% sealed. Like what? And what I love about that is that he holds himself to that standard because of who he is. And he, because he loves you so much, will hold you to that standard. He values you enough to hold you to that standard. Yes, Hina. 
Thank you. Hina, uh, how to have a revenue explosion? You know, I think, again, it comes down to who you are being. And then also, I would say many of us have limiting beliefs when it comes to money. So we have a lot of judgments around money and also what we can earn, how much we can earn. If creation is finished, then all there is all there ever will be, it's all here. So who do you need to be to have a revenue explosion? What would you be doing that's different? How would you be treating your finances now? What are some ways of thinking and feeling that would be different? And then you want to move into those actions and not there's something um there's a story that earl nightingale talks about called acres of diamonds so then when you decide this you start to see it you know this story yes bns yeah so the story goes that you know there was this farmer that heard there were diamonds in the area and on the land in the area so he sold his land to go in pursuit of these diamonds never found them and then real and then would learn that the people that bought his land had found diamonds on the land, but he did not know what diamonds look like in their rough state. So you also want to think about like, what are your acres of diamonds? There are so many opportunities, except that there are so many opportunities that could literally be under your foot right now, under your feet, that you want to start to recognize. So be open to the opportunities and don't limit the way that your revenue can come to you. Thank you, Hina. Hina, can you explain us the law of compensation? Yes, the law of compensation, it states that, you know, sometimes we think that we are going to be paid on what we are doing, but it is your ability to do it is a big piece of it. And then, you know, the difficulty there is in replacing you. So your ability to do it, which is why you always want to never, this is also what I love about Steve and Bob is that they always had the attitude of a student, always learning, always learning your craft, your ability to do it. And then also the difficulty that there is in replacing you. Nobody could replace Steve. Nobody can replace Bob. You know, and so that is also part of it. And that's part of how you will be compensated, like comp- and compensation, again, can come in so many different forms. Yes, Hina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Hina, can you tell us what is glad giving? Yes, glad giving is in Victor Bach's work, which I really love. So he wrote a book and he talks about glad giving. Now, many times when you first hear about this, so it's basically giving a percentage of your salary. We think of it like sometimes in religious ways, like tithing, but glad giving really speaks to giving one to 5%. And there's a reason for that. It shouldn't cause you hardship, but you make it automatic. So what you're doing is you're giving a like 1%, it could be of your salary of what you bring home, to a cause, to something that is important to you. What you're now doing is keeping money in circulation and you're giving with gratitude. And it's not about getting into heaven. There's no religious connotation here. It's really about the mechanics of of keeping things in circulation and knowing that, you know, it's all giving and receiving are two sides of the same coin. And so as you are giving, you're also enlarging your capacity to receive. So it's a beautiful thing to do. And now it's easier than ever. I mean, back in the day, you would be writing checks or things like that. And now you can set it up online. Uh, we, We do that in my family. And it's something many of my clients do as well. And it really puts 
money in circulation into motion. Yes, you know, I really like that concept, and I was talking about this to a friend in the morning, and he was so ha- uh, happy to listen about this. So, thank you for giving the idea <laughs> to me. Yeah. So, Ahina, uh, can you talk about the upper limit problem? Yes. Yeah, so, upper limit is something that is talked about in Gay Hendricks' work, The Big Leap. So, let's say BNS, you like are doing. So, you've got ten millions, not ten million. <laughs> Because you would hit your upper limit before, so let's say you have, you, you're you're hitting, you're almost at, you're so close to a million subscribers on YouTube, and things are flowing to you. All of these opportunities are just flowing to you. Things are so good. Your relationships are really really good. Life is amazing. This is a time when you might sabotage something. And it sounds a little nutty. It's like, why would I do that? But we feel like something's going to go wrong or we're not used to having all of this good that we create some drama or conflict or worry because of some judgments that we have about having all of this. So what that could look like, it's, it's like little things. What it could look like is that, okay, you're almost at a million and then your platform crashes or you're about to do a uh, one of the biggest interviews of your life you're about to do it you're interviewing oprah let's say and she's ready to go you're ready to go and then it's like the the there's a glitch on the internet it doesn't happen or you start causing unconsciously like problems in your personal life so this is what we do and it's it can be really subtle or it can be more dramatic and it it's because we live in a world where we've always been told things like the other shoe is going to drop it's too good to be true don't count your chickens or eggs or something one of them before they hatch your chickens before they hatch like we we're always taught like it's it's not it's not going to last it's not going to last and many of us are not wired to have things going really really well all the time and that that is our normal and so we hit this upper limit because we're like it's actually we actually feel it's not safe like we don't know this like who am i at a million subscribers who am i with everything going on and well in my life let me now go back mess something up unconsciously so that i can go back to my self image that i'm comfortable at the 500,000 mark that like that i can lean into so let me somehow get back to that or create problems elsewhere that take me out of my business for a while. So that's the upper limit. And it is really, really sneaky. And it's going to try to keep you at a certain set point. So you've, when you see it happening, when you see that you're starting to sabotage things, oh, here's another way it can show up, BNS. Let's say you want to make $10,000 a month. Your set point financially is $5,000 a month. Let's say you hit $5,000 halfway through the month. Well, you would think, oh my God, this is so good. I'm going to hit 10,000, no problem. But what happens is you stop taking action. You're doing other things because to your set point, you've reached your goal. And so you, and then by the end of the month, maybe you're at five, five, maybe you're at six or seven, but you're not at 10 because you've automatically started to change your actions so that you're staying at that set point. Yes, Hina. Whatever you say is uh, real life applicable. So (laughs) thank you. Uh, And as you you say, it is too good. And also it is true. (laughs) So yeah, yes, it is good. And it's true. The other shoe is not going to drop. We just buy more shoes. (laughs) (laughs) Super. Yeah. Um, well, which is why BNS, when my clients tell me things, I just made my annual income, my monthly income, or, you know, I hit this goal or that goal, I always say, oh my gosh, I love your now normal. Like we want to normalize it right away. Like celebrate it for sure, but also normalize it. Yeah, of course you did. That's who you are. Yes, Hina. 
Hina, what are some common mindset blocks that people have that blocks them to earn money? And I think this would summarize the entire things that you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I would say that money is the root of all evil. That what the desire for wealth is bad. It means you're greedy. That that a person may feel that they are not worthy of it. Um, other mindset blocks are that money changes people in a bad way. Whereas, and, you know, money only amplifies who you are. Like, it's, you're just so, you know, you're a kind person with money or you're a jerk with money. Um, but we, we put a lot on it in a negative way. And that really blocks us from receiving and from having. And, you know, for me, I think also like that 50 want list that we talked about can just open you up to what you want because many people feel that it is wrong for them to desire wealth. And what I love is that I have a, I have a, a small group called the Inner Circle. There's nine people in it. And they were sharing about what their desires are and all of them have a money component. And I love that. And I love that we can speak so openly about it and really wanting to create generational wealth, um, really wanting to make a difference with, you know, what they can do with money. And, and these people, if you met them, BNS, they're the most incredible people and gosh, the things that they are doing and will do is going to change the world. It's going to change the world, not only their life, but the world. And so it's seeing. So what holds us back is these misconceptions and not understanding money and the judgments that we have about it in those way in that way and not being honest with ourselves. If it's something that you desire, there's people that really they're fine, they don't desire it. But if you do, that's okay. I do. It's fun, it's so fun to be generous too. It is so fun. Do you know there's this thing that I do once in a while when I feel like I desire to uh, and my clients do it and I was out with my boys and they were like, let's do it. And it's called tipping the bill. So you literally, if the bill is like one hundred dollars, then you tip one hundred dollars. So you, you tip <laughs> the bill, and it is so much fun to do. And these are the things that you can do with ease. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> you know, really. Yeah. yeah. You know, last question: Would you like to issue a seven-day challenge to our subscribers? Hmm. Oh, a seven day challenge. Yes, I would. This is just something that has really helped me around self image. If we go back to self image, I would say for the next seven days, think of maybe about six people that you admire write their names down and then write different aspects of their life and you'll start to maybe see some patterns there might be some things that are different from the car that they drive to how they live to how are their relationships are they service oriented um what income bracket are they in how do they meet and greet people that's really good as well and then from that just see what comes up for you then you create your own self image, but start in the third person. So, you know, she shows up in this way. She has X amount of clients, she this and that. And then after the, and then write it out every single day, write out this person. It's like you're creating this aspirational person. And then I would say, do that for seven days. After the seven days, change it to I. The reason I say to do it in the third person first is because sometimes in the you can accept it in the third person, like she is like that. But if you start with I am like that, sometimes it's like BS, 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 not BNS. 
You know what I mean? You're, 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 you're doubting. It's built. It's bringing up too much doubt, right? In your mind. So it's easier to say there's this person. She's like this. She shows up like this. Her business is like this. Her family is like this. She drives this. She lives here. And then after seven days, so let's make it a 14 day challenge. After seven days, move it to I. I am. Da, 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 da. And then be that person. So that it's just another way into self image work. Done. <laughs> so Hina, thank you so much for coming to the show and helping us to become enlightened. It was so fun. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And you know what time it is on my clock? Eleven, eleven. <laughs> yes. Steve Hardison. <laughs> yeah, Let's see. You are watching us on BNS Goku Great. Subscribe, and then you're going to get all of this amazing content.